Okay, look, today I'm in Chelmsford talking to Barry Dennis. Everybody will know from the, the betting ring and from Channel 4 and from the Sun newspaper. Um, Barry, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, talk to us. Uh, can you please start at the beginning and give us a bit of an insight into your uh, beginnings? Yeah, sure, it's a pleasure. What is the beginnings? I difficult to say. Let's go down this route that my father passed away just after the Second World War, so I had a stepfather. And he used to give me envelopes to post on the way to school every morning. And I didn't know what that was all about until one day I forgot to post it. And I thought, oh my God. So I opened it up and inside there was a five shilling postal order where he wanted two and sixpence each way, a horse, and it was to McLaughlin's. I don't know how many people of you lot have ever heard of McLaughlin's of Scotland. They accepted postal bets, providing the time was before 10 o'clock on the day of the race. So anyway, he'd lost. I thought, now what do I do? And so I fessed up to him, didn't I? I'd give his five shillings back. And I said, I didn't know that was what he was doing. But that gave me the interest of what he was studying for him every night and sending off these envelopes to McLaughlin's having bets the same day of the race, guys. Remember that, like, and I mean, just had to have a postmark before 10 o'clock in the morning. But, so as the big races come along, Derby or Grand National or anything like that, I took a bigger interest in what he'd, he'd backed. And so that got me into the game, if you like, that there was gambling the way he could play. And although he was a mug and he lost, I just thought, oh, this is fun, like, you know what I mean? So that was when I was like eight or nine or 10. Now he's talking about I'm 78, that's 70 years ago. So did that start me off in the racing game? Well, when I went to secondary school at the age of 11, um, a big race come around, I think that was probably the Derby, and there was a geezer named Lester Pickett riding something called Never Say Die. Uh, so I told all the kids at school, you see how you have a bet like, you know, when you have six months each way and I'll pay you out when it wins, blah, blah, blah. And they all back. Lester Piggott, 33 to 1, never say die. I'd done a fortune, hadn't got enough money to pay him, but I had been school for two weeks. So what I did was, I lived in, my address was 53 Marketplace, Romford. And I lived a bow in a flat with my mum, above a cafe. And I used to go down in the market and duck and dive down there. When I load the barrows and running the fruit around and the veg from their stores out the back, they used to tip me a few quid. And so consequently, that's where I could earn money during the course of the week out of Romford Market. Just after the war, there was a paper shortage. And the guy used to come around with the lorry every Monday and he used to buy cardboard and paper off you that was all bundled up. So there I was scavenging amongst all the stalls, picking up paper and tying it all up to sell it to this geezer. So eventually I got enough money to go back to school and pay them all off. They were pleased to see me, I can assure you. So. Next time a big race come around, a mate of mine, who turned out to be my best man at my wedding, Roy Cook, God, poor old Cook, he rest in peace, he said, I know a bloke that's got a house down the Brentwood Road in Romford where you can put bets on. I thought, well, blimey, we'll get into this one. Like, we'll have a hedge next time. We can't keep standing this and having to miss school. So next race come along, went down, knocked on the door, 172 Brentwood Road, Romford. And the guy comes, what do you want? I said, I want to put some bets on, mister. He said, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 12, 13 or something like that. So he says, come in, let's talk. Anyway, long story short, he was Les Carey, who became George Brent. And when betting shops opened in 1961, he was already running this office from his house. He opened up betting shops. And so I became a betting shop manager in 1961. Good stories about, though, with Les Carey. After a while, I used to clean his car. He had a big Humber Super Snipe, big as the house it was, the car. And he used to give me five shillings. That's 25 pence, guys, okay? Five shillings for cleaning it. And I always put the five shillings on the first, <coughs> first favourite at Park Royal. Every Monday I cleaned the car. I don't think it ever won. Anyway, I then started working for him in the evenings on the phones when he wanted to go out having a drink and take the bets over the phone. So it's obvious that when Bending shops were opened in 1961. He opened up one in Romford to kick off with. With inside 12 months, he had 20 bedding shops all around the east area of Essex, Barking, Dagenham, and I was working in the betting shop game. And so that's how I really got into racing.
So Barry, when did your um, when did you first actually start going racing and taking interest in the on-course business? Well, that happened because after about five or six, seven years, listen, remember guys, now I'm 78, the years are so long ago, but I hope that I've got the right dates. After six or seven years, he sold out to Corals, the George Brent shops, and he retired, went to Greece. Uh, Les Carey did, or George Brent is in it. By the way, in between all that, during that period, he was renowned and famous, we were all famous, for the Dagnum Dog Coup. We organised the Dagenham Dog, Dog Coup back in 1964. And well, we nearly got a few million pounds, but we didn't get paid. So that's another story. So when he did sell out and retire, 67, Corals took over. Well, it weren't the same terms anymore and it was all a lot stricter. And um, I finished up leaving the game then. And I, I went to work for the Essex Water Company on the 1st of January, 1968 as a clerk. I worked there for about a year and I went to the Epsom Derby as a bookmaker on the one-off day a year just for the fun of it. And so then I thought I'll apply for pitches. So I went to the um, NJPC, National Joint Pitch Council, where you applied and put my name down. And after about a year, they gave me the four shilling ring at Brighton. There was five rings at Brighton in them days. The four shilling ring was opposite the main grandstand and if you look behind, you could see the sea, but don't walk back too far because you'd fall over the cliff and finish up in the sea. Anyway, so that was my first ever venture, a four shilling ring at Brighton. Barry, you can't leave it there. You've got to go back to the Dagenham Dog Coup. Right, well, the Dagenham Dog Coup, this, let's go with the story. In the office one day, the other officers were ringing up and said, there's um, people going around having two pound place on the favourite in the first race at Dagenham today. And so all sold all round the shops, he'd got perhaps 100 or 200 quid a, a place. So he said, come on, Bell. He, he collected me, let's carry him. We went over to Dagnum Dogs, went in. And the coup was, they was going to stuff loads of money on the outside and nearly off. The market would have been very weak the first race at Dagnum on a Tuesday afternoon. The market would be weak and the stuff. Loads of money on the outside, they had no chance. So the favourite would probably play three or four to one. So Les and I stepped in, he gave me a few quid and we started backing a favourite for a place. <laughs> the favourite got placed, paid a less than even money a place. There was some 50 cup, fisty cups, knives were drawn and old Bill arrived and we was all carted off down the local nick and none of us would press charge and it was dropped. So the person that had organised it, John Turner, John Turner and his mate Reg the Rigger, nice names, isn't they? So they said, you've ruined us, like you know what I mean? We was going to arrange a big coup. So they said, what's the big coup? He said, we're going to have a dog forecast coup. He said, when we won enough money. So they said, come on, I'm in on this. We'll start to sort this all out. So he, he put his money in it. And there's a place in Romford near called the Willow Rooms. It's actually where I did my wedding reception, just round the corner from the betting shop. The Willow Rooms. It was owned by Les Carey as well, the Willow Rooms. And he had a meeting. Um, and he said, right, these are the numbered windows. We've numbered all the windows at Dagenham. He's got 40 market workers there. He gave them all loads of copper coins and shillings and pence. And he said, right, you go round these windows and do traps one and six reverse. Keep doing one and six reverse for two shillings reverse, two shillings reverse. Just keep doing them. And you've got somebody behind you. Don't let anybody else get in the window. We're going to keep doing one and six reverse. Then just before the off... John Turner, who was um, the instigated it all, had a two, three, four, five, 24 shilling combination. Well, he'd managed to get 1,500 pound on one and six reversed. And so when the combination came out, I think four beat two, if I can remember rightly, or two beat four, something like that. Obviously, the whole pool, less their deductions, the dividend for a seven of all chance to beat an 11 of all chance, you come to £1,093 uh, £1, or £43, well over a £1,000. Well, during that day, the staff had been all round England putting on two, three, four, five combinations for 24 shillings, two, three, four, in all the betting shops right the way through the country. And we'd got it on for plenty and plenty of money. Like, I mean, my, my whack alone was going to come to £5,000 out of it all. You only had to have it five times, didn't you? And, like, you know what I mean, got five grand. Well, they couldn't pay, could they? The answer was the betting shops could not pay. So it went to court and 
they said that there was collusion and I don't know, what, what's collusion about it? Just because nobody else could get on. And so none of us got paid, but that was the Dagnum dog coup organised by us. Right, back in the day, Barry, when you were um, trying to get on course, I mean, you wouldn't live long enough to get a pitch at Cheltenham, etc. The dead man's shoe system must have been very frustrating for you. Ex extremely frustrating. Remember, I've got mainly silver rings for the first two or three years. But um, Lingfield for one, they amalgamated, made it all one ring. Lots of tracks started leaving out silver rings and just one ring. Well, all weather started. And the regular bookmakers in the winter, they, they called it the kipper season, didn't they? The, the regular bookmakers went off to the Bahamas or somewhere. They didn't need to go to these um, meetings in January, February, March. So when the all weather season started, I think I had a Lingfield pick number 36. Well, that got me nowhere near the front line. But on some occasions during this um, all-weather season, it started on really bad days, sleet, frost, snow. Perhaps only 10 bookmakers turned up. So I got a much better pick because I was probably in pick number 10 by then. Well, there was one particular day, only six bookmakers turned up. And I was in pick number six. Well, that's heaven for me. I've never been as close as that to the front row ever, ever, ever. But as the meeting progressed and the weather got worse and worse and worse, they all started dropping out, even the other bookmakers. So come the last race, I was in pick number one. <laughs> They'd all gone home. And the SP reporters all clustering around my ball because I got to send a show out to all the betting shops. But I couldn't get any prices on the ball because it was the old shulk. The, the rain kept washing them all off. So the SP reporters came up and said, what was you going to put up, Barry? So I got hold of my lump of paper and said I was going to put up one at seven of all. They couldn't get any prices on the ball. So after that, when I come home, I thought, this is madness. I stand out the back there in all this weather, and then on Saturday, when the sun shines, they're all going to be back. I'll be back in pick number 36. So I went to the management. I said, I pay five times the admission. The admission to get in here is about two quid. I pay 10 quid. I'll give you 100 pounds to go in trap number one. I said, cool, will you? I said, yeah, I'll pay 100 pounds just to bet in number one instead of a tenner. Uh, and that caused a Ferrari, didn't it? And I said, well, I said what, what's going on? They've got these pitches forever. They don't want to use them. I've got to get up the front to make any living. So it took a bit of time, but with inside a year or so, the BPA, and well, you, everybody knows like that. You had to be a geriatric to be on the board of the BPA, and they all had their vested interests and in what happened on course, didn't they? So that was a boo-hoo, but suddenly they come around to the idea, well, they've been working there for 40 or 50 years. They're getting into their 70s. If somebody's going to pay them a few grand for the pitch and they could retire, that would be a good idea. So suddenly they changed their minds. Yeah, come on, we'll have a meeting and we'll sell all these pitches. And lo and behold, after a few years, there was an auction at Sandown and all the old timers wanted to go out and take some took good money, 100, 200,000, went out of the game and they were pleased to do it. So we changed it after four or five years that is now no, no longer dead men's shoes. You couldn't pass them on, you could sell them though. When you suddenly got onto those pitches, when you bought up, were they as you imagined to be when you were looking from the back row? Well, when I when it came round to the day of the sale, it was a Sunday, and as uh, many people know, one of my friends that lived locally was David Johnson, the big um, horse owner of Jumps Horse Race, owner of them days, and I said to him, "I'd love to buy pitches," I said, "but I can't afford them." He says, "Well, I'll lend you the money." I'll, I'll back you. I said, yeah, uh, all right, David. I said, but what's the interest? He said, tell you what I'll do. You go and buy whatever you want. Whatever it comes to, I'll pay and we'll shake hands whatever interest rate you want to pay. Well, it couldn't be fairer than that, could you? Like, you know what I mean? It's a fantastic deal. So I went along and spent a quarter of a million pound of his money buying pitches, didn't I? <laughs> so I go home. I said, I'm married like that night. She said, what happened? I said, I bought some pitches. She said, how much did you spend? I said, 250000 She fainted, didn't she? Like, I said, where are we going to pay that back from? I said, don't worry, I'll win it. Now I've got these pitches, I will win it. So when you got in them, did you suddenly think, oh, I can win this easier? Did you did you realise it maybe? When I got way? into the pitches, I thought, this is like finding money in the street. Absolutely unbelievable. Remember in the old older days, Fred Benz had pick number one everywhere. He never ever held any money, he hedged with the second row, the second row hedged with the third row, and so he was up for none and could only win. Well, I had never had any idea, I was never going to do that, I just c couldn't stop taking money. I, I was turning over two million a year in the back rows. 
The day I went into the front rows, I was turning over 15 million a year. That's how much it jumped. And betting's 10% better than I was in the back rows. So, I'd say it was a gold mine.